Well, good afternoon, everybody. Super excited to be here. What an awesome opportunity. It wasn't too long ago as I was sitting in those chairs. You probably heard that from every speaker today that came from the Academy, but this is incredible to be able to come back and have that book and completion to the experience of sitting in these chairs and learning from where you're at and struggling through the Academy as a cadet to now coming back and sharing the lessons and probably the most important lesson for me that what I experienced here was the foundation for everything that I've been afforded to accomplish since then. So a little bit more details about my background. I wanna connect with you personally. I'm gonna give you a little more details on my story. So as Brian said, I was a fighter pilot for 14 years in the Air Force, graduated from here in 1999. And uh, then I went on and got my MBA from the University of Texas. Today, I'm the CEO of a company called Afterburner. I didn't start Afterburner. It was started 25 years ago when I was still at the Air Force Academy. But it's a team of former elite military members. Think fighter pilots, Navy SEALs, Army Rangers. And we took what made us successful in our complex, dynamic, high-stakes environment of the battlefield and bring those same principles to come to bear for elite teams in the boardroom and help them succeed in a corporate environment. So for those of you who don't have a military background, this is the plane that I flew, the F-15. To give you an idea what it's like to fly an F-15, this is the same dimensions as a tennis court. So if you can picture me sitting around the net of a tennis court and flying that around the sky, that's about what it's like to fly an F-15. Now when this picture was taken, I was on top of my game, on top of the world, on top of my plane, ready to take on anything. But life, as it often does, threw me a curveball. That curveball was in the form of cancer, and not just cancer, but stage four cancer. Not just stage four cancer, but a particularly rare and deadly type of cancer, and they gave me about 18 months to live. I don't know if you heard Brian say it, but they told me I had a 15% chance to live five years. And so at this time, I felt like I was a picture of good health. I was doing fantastic. This could not have been more of a surprise to me. And to be honest with you, when this happened, I spent about the first 30 days curled up in the fetal position, just feeling sorry for myself. When those 30 days were over with, I got myself up, I dusted myself off, and I said, you know, with whatever time I've got left, I'm gonna try to make an impact. I'm trying to leave a legacy. I'm gonna try to do something of significance for myself, for my family, for my community. I'm gonna go into more details on that later because that was the big epiphany of my cancer battle and this big trial that I had. But one of the things I got a chance to do as I continued to uh, keep cancer at bay and get treatments and do a year's worth of chemotherapy and my hair turns silver and falls out and I'm really gaunt and, and wasting away, I'm, I'm able to start recovering and get better. And I'm approaching the five year point of my cancer battle and I'm still feeling pretty good. Uh, so on a day when my doctors told me with 85% certainty that I'd be dead, because I had a 15% chance to be there, instead, I took the opportunity to go down to New Zealand and go complete an Ironman triathlon. It was the most amazing thing I've ever done. Any Ironman triathletes in the room? Nobody? Good, I'll save you the trip. Uh, it wasn't that fun. It, it's off my bucket list. I don't ever want to do something like that again. But it was an amazing experience. I enjoyed every minute of it. And I succeeded. I crossed the finish line with that one. But I didn't succeed at everything that I took on after that. I made it a habit of getting outside of my comfort zone. After you have cancer, you, you come to the realization you don't quite care what people think anymore because one, they're just not paying attention to you anyway. And two, you shouldn't have worried about that in the first place because you should be pursuing the things that make you happy. So I decided I'm going to 40 one years old, I'm going to go out for this crazy TV show and go see what can happen if I get on. Drum roll, please. Building the suspense. All right, let's audible to you. You just clicking it forward for me. American Ninja Warrior. So, was on the last two seasons of American Ninja Warrior. Failed spectacularly, if you guys saw me on, on this. It's a lot harder than you, it looks, too, by the way, when you're watching from the couch. Uh, and I'm getting ready to go compete on this same uh, show in about six weeks in Washington, D.C. I've had a great time being a part of this, but this has been my journey from you know, death's door in 2010 and, and, and really having no chances to getting an opportunity to do things like this, climbing Mount Kilimanjaro with this incredible group of people, the gentleman right behind me is the CEO of a company called VMware, $70 billion in market cap. We got together, climbed this mountain, got way outside of our comfort zone. This is Mount Kilimanjaro, the tallest mountain on the African continent. Uh, it was a massive growth experience, but then we also raised $350,000 to give back at the same time uh, to build schools in Africa for young women. I'm going to come back to that theme, that combination of growth and giving, of terror and exhilaration in life 
and how that's the thing that I clung to when I was at death's door, and how giving back is critical as well. And then this is from last week. Literally one week ago today, I was in Antarctica uh, celebrating my 10-year anniversary of cancer. So I've had an amazing ride. Cancer's never really gone. When you have stage four cancer, you know it's always lingering in the back of your mind and it's never, it's never officially cured. And so I've got that to contend with. But to be quite honest with you, it gives me a sense of urgency, right? And it gives me an opportunity to go do cool things like this, speak to a big crowd and, uh, and, and have a great time doing it, put myself out there because who knows how many more chances you get to do that. What I'm really here to talk about today, not individual contributions, not what we can do as an individual, but to talk about teams and how you can unlock the potential of a diverse team. Diversity is the buzzword of the decade, right? I mean, we hear it, it all over the place, whether it's at the Air Force Academy trying to maintain the same diversity metrics that we see in, uh, in public places, or it's in the business world trying to maintain diversity. Why is that so important? Why is diversity something that comes up again and again and again? Well, the real reason that diversity keeps coming up is because diverse teams are more effective. Diverse teams are more successful. And that's not anecdotal, that's not just based off of somebody's notion of it, a story, that's based off of research, that's empirical. Study after study has shown that if you build a team and you make it diverse, you are going to be more successful than a homogeneous team, a team that's built of people that have the same way of approaching problems. Let's define diversity. Diversity is effectively groups of people that approach problem solving differently. That's the most important part about it, that we bring people together that approach problem solving differently so that we can tap into that wisdom of the crowd and be able to learn from each of them and thereby come up with a better solution as a team because we have that diverse crowd. We have great proxies for diversity with gender and religious background and race. The best one that I've seen in, in the best way I've seen this exhibited and the teams that I've been a part of that are the most effective at unlocking the power of diverse organizations, believe it or not, is the military. From my military experience, they are better at creating an inclusive environment because after all, that's what's required. It's one thing to put a diverse team together, but let's be honest, it's gonna to be tougher to unlock the potential of a diverse team because if you approach problem solving differently, if you approach thinking about the world differently because you're diverse, by definition, it's gonna be a little bit harder to create that dialogue and to leverage the right conversations to get to the solution. So we have to create an inclusive environment. The military did a better job than that than any corporation I've been exposed to, and I've been exposed to hundred, hundreds of corporations at this point. Let me give you an example. We would take 25 allied countries in a training exercise, go to Operation Red Flag, and we bring those 25 countries together, many of whom didn't even speak the same language, some of whom didn't even like each other, and yet we would build a common vision for success, a common strategy to pursue that vision, and a common cadence for execution. I saw it done again and again and again. And for those of you in the audience who are cadets, you're about to be exposed to that type of planning mechanism, that type of inclusion mechanism that I believe doesn't exist at that, uh, at that extent anywhere else. But you're not gonna be taught that in a practical, applicable manner, meaning the Air Force does a great job of creating those results. What I'm gonna show you today is how the company that we work for has distilled that down into key principles in a practical, applicable methodology that you can roll out again and again and again with your teams. So we've used this with NFL teams, we've used this with hundreds of corporations. I did this uh, three weeks ago, putting together a plan between IBM and VMware on a $300 million opportunity that they're pursuing, and this just works. Let's give you some examples of how this practical, applicable methodology has been uh, applied in the past. It's about having a common mental model. That first step is so critical. You have to align on what success looks like in the long term. What is our mission objective? I flew 2,500 missions 2,500 times. I had a mission objective written at the top of the board as we bring in all these different men and women from different countries. We're out to go tackle that same mission. We have to be aligned to that objective. There was one point in my career where I was in charge of a flight. This is at Randolph Air Force Base. Men and women from the United States that were pilots. And then we also had an Iraqi student and a Kuwaiti student, student in the same class. If you know anything about history, what's gonna happen here when you have these students together? So, I mean, oil and water, massive war in the early 90s, Iraq invaded Kuwait, some horrible things were done. And so these guys hated each other. They could not get along for anything. 
But I'm here to tell you that when they got into the air and we would plan a mission together and we would execute together because they had a common mental model, because they had a common mission objective and a way of executing, they were still able to get the job done and unlock the power of that diverse team. That's an extreme example. We'll probably never find ourselves there. But if it works in that extreme example, it'll work in others. You have to create the 1 plus 1 equals 10 story, though. In other words, you have to create the buy-in that that mission objective is so compelling that it's worth us investing our time to get to work together as a team. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. There's times to go fast. You have to earn the buy-in and the alignment from those diverse team members that this is the time to go together, and that there is a better together story that we're pursuing. Once you know that mission objective, the very next thing that you're gonna do is ask your team, why will we fail? It seems totally counterintuitive, right? You finally got them aligned to this objective, got all this momentum going in the right direction, and you pull the air out of the room and say, all right, what's gonna stop us from succeeding? But this is exactly what we did as fighter pods. We would say, what's gonna kill us out there today? Let's have a real open, honest conversation about this. I was working with uh, an NFL team a couple years ago. I won't tell you who, the Houston Texans. <laughs> and when we were working together, the coach pulls me aside and says, hey, I'm really glad that you're here because we're trying to uh, build some better, some better plans behind the scenes. I need to help your, your help with this one individual. I said, all right, coach, tell me what happened. So, all right, so it's planning stage. Sunday's over, we're back getting ready for the next game. It's Monday, Tuesday time frame. And uh, we're looking at tapes from the previous week and we're developing the plans. And I'm rolling out the plans and I keep telling them what I want them to do. And there's this guy who every single time raises his hand and says, I'm not on board with that. That's gonna fail and here's why. And I said, okay, so what ends up happening? He goes, well, the worst part is he's usually right. Like the next Sunday, the reason he said we'd fail ends up being what happens. And I said, okay, coach, so what do you want me to do? And he said, well, I want you to shut them up. And I said, coach, you have in your room somebody who's going to tell you why you're going to fail. And by the way, he's not just giving voice to this and surprising everybody. Everyone in the room is thinking the same thing. He's the only one who's bold enough and brave enough to step up to the head coach and say this. And he wants to shut him up. Well, he, had, he did. He effectively shut him up. And he wasn't there much longer at the, at the Houston Texans because of that. But that's a great example of how we have to stand up to those problems. It's not going to pull the motivation from the room. When you've got the diverse team, ask them why, the, why you'll fail. And they're going to give you some great reasons why that'll take place. The next conversation I want you to have is what are our core competencies? What do we uniquely bring to the table? I gave you the IBM and VMware example. So IBM is something like $120 billion market cap company. VMware is $70 billion, massive tech. They have to build a sense of cooperation, though, of cooperation, but knowing that they're still going to compete in the marketplace at the same time. So one of the key things that came out of their conversation is, what are the swim lanes that we are going to cooperate in? What are the core competencies that this company is going to bring to the table? What are the core competencies this other company is going to bring to the table? What's the chocolate and peanut butter mix that we're super excited about putting together and unleashing as a team? We have to be honest about knowing those core competencies and knowing what the resources are before we take the next step. And this next step is super critical because this is really where you're going to leverage the insights of this diverse audience, where you're going to pull the wisdom of the crowd, the phone a friend option, where you're gonna bring in all these great answers and insights from across the spectrum. And here's what I want you to say to this team. I want you to say, all right, who's done a mission objective like this before? Point right at that mission objective and say, specifically this one, who's done something like this? Raise your hand. Of those people whose hands are raised, I want you to give us one piece of advice based on your experience, something we absolutely have to do or we absolutely have to avoid based on some story from your past, and then let that be like the mic dropping moment and you walked away. That would be the last thing you said to this team to ensure our success. We're tapping into years of knowledge when we do this. When I do this with a room full of South Korean pilots and Japanese pilots and Denmark pilots and folks from all over the place, and they give us these insights and flying all, in all these different regions and all these different places, this is when the plan really comes together. And this is when you're truly building and unlocking that power of that diverse team, which takes us into the next step, which is to building the, co the course, course of action, saying who is gonna do what by when. If you look at this, this is pretty far down the list. We got six steps, this is the fifth one. Super intentional though, because I need to earn your buy-in first. I need to earn your alignment that you're actually gonna do what we assign to you here, and the only way we can do that is by scoping out the battlefield first. 
What are we trying to accomplish? What's gonna stop us in the form of threats? What are the resources we're gonna pull from each team member, these diverse groups? And then what are the lessons learned from the past? Then and only then do we start talking about what the actual plan is gonna look like. And then finally, plan for contingencies. What if? Here's why this is so important, because you're gonna build a plan and somebody's gonna say, you know, this is a great idea, but this is all going away if this happens. And this is a great idea, but nobody's really considering what we're gonna do in this case. And you're trying to build that confidence that they are considering that, and we have looked at it. Here's the equivalent in my world when I was flying. I had a checklist on my leg that I flew with every single time I flew. I'd strap it to my leg, and it was a checklist full of emergency procedures. I flew for 14 years, and I probably pulled that checklist out maybe 10 times in those 14 years. Why was it so important to have that every single time I flew? Because when I'm flying faster than the speed of sound, three feet away from another aircraft, I need that warm fuzzy that if something does happen, I'm gonna be able to adapt and react, and I got a checklist to at least start that process. It doesn't have every step in there. It doesn't take me all the way down to landing in this, but it at least shows that we have considered what the contingencies are gonna look like, and we've built buy-in with this team that even though we mapped out this plan, that we're gonna be able to adapt and react. Because after all, we know the plan needs to change. Sun Tzu said that no plan survives first contact with the enemy. Or as the other great philosopher, Mike Tyson said, everyone's got a plan until they get punched in the mouth, right? We've got to be adaptive, we've got to be reactive, we've got to be able to have flexibility and agility in the way we roll out our plan. Contingencies allow us to do that. So folks, we've played this out with hundreds of companies in different settings with elite athletic teams, with corporations, with multinational corporations, and really these are the core concepts that have helped us to unlock those victories with diverse teams and unlock the potential. I could go, go through example after example, but if you'll indulge me, I think our time is better spent to talk about and finish this off with my interpretation of the private victories that need to precede the public victories. Stephen Covey said, private victories have to precede public victories and we have to do things for ourselves. We have to create our own sense of identity of success before we can create significance and be a part of a team in the future. So I told you earlier that I was effectively on my deathbed for uh, about 18 months. And by that I mean, they told, my doctors told me, just plan any point in time, you're gonna get the bad news, and then you have about a six month slide until you pass away. So we planned every trip, uh, you know, go to Disney World, uh, do everything that we wanna get out of, in our lives as quickly as we can, get out all the pictures we can. I made videos for my kids, I had a one year old and a three year old at the time, and uh, for their birthdays, for their graduations, all those, all those morbid things you can think of as your, at, at your perceived end of life. And so I'm effectively on my deathbed. There's a great quote that the dying have the most to teach us about life. And I don't know if I have anything to teach you, but I certainly learned a lot myself during this time period. I had some massive epiphanies, I had some massive clarity that I hadn't been given access to prior to this moment. I remember thinking, gosh, I wish I knew this before I went through this ordeal because it would have made my life different on the other side. So I'm gonna share with you my three biggest takeaways from living on my deathbed for 18 months. So when you get to your deathbed and when you get to that point where you feel like you're at your end of life, one of the logical steps you take is look backwards and take stock of everything that's happened up until that point. And I'll tell you, the, I was surprised when I did that. I was surprised by what, what I was proud of and I was surprised by what I regretted. So my regrets were not those things that I failed at. And I had a ton of stuff I failed at. We could, we could create a list. Where's my former AOC, Tim Miller? And here, there he is right there. He can tell you a ton of things that I failed at when I was at the Air Force Academy here. And, uh, and they're all true. And, and, and yet, I didn't regret the failures. You know what I regretted? Those times that I didn't try at all. Those times when I let life get in the way, when I let somebody intimidate me, when I was worried about what you thought about me, and I didn't try at all because I would rather have this notion of what I could do but never be tested than actually put it out there, get tested, find out I failed, be embarrassed, go through all that self-introspection that, that happens when that occurs. But at my end of life, I didn't care about the failures. And so my massive epiphany, and the first thing I want you to take away from this, is that growth is so important. The, the thing that feels best in life is growth. Getting outside of your comfort zone, growth implies that you are going to do something to get outside of your comfort zone. So I challenge myself to do that each and every day. And believe it or not, when I got cancer, I was firmly planted inside my comfort zone. It was 2010, I've been flying for about nine years at that point. 
And even though I was doing amazing things in an airplane, it'd become pretty rote by that stage. And to give you a quick example, how, how much it's become just kind of the day job. I was flying close trail uh, with another aircraft, which means for those future pilots in the world, you're gonna get used to this real fast in pod training. We're going about 500 miles an hour. I'm in a T-38, I'm 10 feet away from the airplane in front of me, and we go upside down. And we're upside down, I'm still 10 feet away. Uh, and I look up, which is down, and I see the highway. And as I'm looking at the highway, I see that uh, there's an accident. And it's all snarled up. And I remember thinking to myself, oh, it's going to take forever to get home today. <laughs> and it dawned on me in that moment that if that's what I care about, I am firmly in my comfort zone. I am cruising. I'm taking a lot of cool pictures and doing flybys for NFL games and other things. But that's all ego-driven and has nothing to do with significance. And it's all hollow and it's all empty. And it meant nothing to me finally when I was on my deathbed. And I said, ah. Oh, there are so many other things that I wanted to do. I love being a pilot, this is amazing, but I didn't want it to be the book. I wanted it to be the chapter in my life, and I wanted to do additional things, and now it's the end, and I don't have any more time, I can't do anything else. And I promised myself that if I was given a second chance, that I would try to do something else. If, you, if you're in a traumatic scenario, sometimes you get what's called survivor's remorse. Survivor's remorse means you feel guilty for, for surviving a situation. A lot of our veterans that come back, a lot of the Navy SEALs that we hire uh, have, have survivor's remorse because they've watched their, their friends die in scenarios that they got to walk away from. And they think, you know, that person was no less deserving of a second chance than I was. I don't have survivor's remorse, even though I have so many friends that I've watched die to, to the disease that I have. But I do have something that I call survivor's obligation. Survivor's obligation is an obligation that we all carry to live our best lives because there are others who wish they were sitting where you're at right now and had the second chance you've been afforded. And you don't have to have cancer in order to be exposed to the survivor's obligation, this sense of having to move, forward, move onward. We all suffer. We all have challenges. I've told you about my story. I guarantee you anybody can come up here and, can, and tell a similar story. It may not involve cancer, but you'll tell me about divorce or hopelessness or the, the trauma you experienced when you were a kid or a breakup or a depression. Whatever that is for you, you're a survivor. You survived it. You have a second chance that somebody else wasn't afforded and somebody else wanted. And so I'll tell you the three G's, the three most important things for me that I strive to do every day as part of my survivor's obligation. The first G is growth. Every single day I try to find something that gets me outside of my comfort zone. Your comfort zone is the enemy to everything that you want in life. So last week on the 10 year anniversary of my cancer battle, this is a picture that was taken in that moment. We are in the Antarctic. So what do you think when you see this picture? Besides never skip leg day. <laughs> We're in the Antarctic. These two guys next to me are dressed up in what normal people would wear in the Antarctic. I'm in my swimsuit. What's around my waist? It's basically fishing line. There is a killer whale that's out there that's swimming around, and they're not going to jump in if I get stuck in the water. They're just going to try to yank on me when I jump in. And this was my way of getting outside of my comfort zone on the 10-year anniversary. But I don't pursue pain for the sake of pain. That's what a sadist does. That's what a masochist does. I'm pursuing this moment of discomfort because this was part of my growth. For months leading up to this, I'm studying Wim Hof. It was an individual who has shown that you can endure frigid cold temperatures in new and exciting ways. And I'm learning about this and it's blowing my mind. And it's super and, and interesting to me and intriguing. And I wanted to go apply it. So here I am jumping in about 28 degree weather or 28 degree water. The weather is well below that. We have icebergs floating around, literally a killer whale that just swam by. And I did it. I jumped into that, uh, that water at that point, got outside of my comfort zone. It was exhilarating and terrifying at the same time. Just like having to go get my MBA after being a pilot was exhilarating and terrifying. Just like having kids was exhilarating and terrifying. Everything we want to have is outside of your comfort zone. Growth is the key to that aspect. The second G is giving. Giving was critical for me. When I was at my lowest, this was my one secret to be able to forget about my problems. So we talked about earlier that, that program that I started in San Antonio, helping out kids that, uh, that were having a really poor graduation rate, 35% in San Antonio in the inner city school district. Just horrific, an unbelievably low graduation rates. 
I'm going through chemotherapy, I'm feeling useless, I'm feeling like I, I can't even help out my family, I'm hooked up to machines, uh, I'm, I just have, I have nothing anymore, nothing to look forward to, and so I just on a whim decided to do this program with a couple other people, and it was the most amazing thing I could do at that point. Not just because we helped these kids, and we did, we, we helped up that graduation rate to about 60% in the four years we did this, from 35%, which was amazing, I'll tell you that story later, but because this was the one time when I could forget about my pain, when I could forget about my problems, when I'm helping out another kid who's a child of migrants, who moves all over the, the country in the south and, and it goes through these amazing challenges, these horrific environments. We heard Ishmael tell this, this, a similar story earlier in the last hour. Imagine hundreds of kids that you're dealing with with stories just like that over and over again. And you can't feel sorry for yourself when you're in that environment and when you're giving back to that group. There's a great phrase that you are the average of the five people that you spend the most time with. And I absolutely believe that's true. You show me your group of friends, I'll show you your future. So I challenge you to go find a group of five whereby you're dragging down the average. Be the one that's not the most successful, that you, the person that in the group who is the least capable of doing what everybody else does. They are gonna pull you up, it's gonna be amazing. But that's not novel, I think people talk about that a lot. I want you to go find another second group in addition to that first one, a group of five where you're at the top, where you're giving back, where you're the mentor. And trust me, everybody in the room has that capability. I certainly did, even in my lowest points, when I weighed 140 pounds and my hair was gone, I could still go out and help these kids and give back. And it was the exact type of support that I needed at that point to get me through that. Growth, giving, the last one, gratitude. This is a game changer. Gratitude is something that's totally transformed my life. I wake up in a bad mood every single day. I just do. That's it. I'm, I'm not a morning guy. I'm, I wake up overwhelmed. I don't like that feeling when you wake up. And so every single day, I got to find something to be grateful for. Start with a win. Start with gratitude. I listen to motivational speeches. It's just what I personally need to do it. And it's totally transformed the way I've been able to approach each and every day since then, knowing that I have to do something that gets me outside of my comfort zone because I'm committed to growth as part of my survivor's obligation. And I'm committed to give at the same time. Let me give you my best example of the power of gratitude. I'm going to tell you about my worst day I ever had. So my worst day on the planet was in 2010, in the March time frame. I'm about five weeks into my cancer battle. They had told me, you know, the hits just kept coming. They said, stage four cancer. Okay, I'm going to have to deal with that. And this in intensely rare cancer, nobody really knows how to deal with it. Okay, I'm going to have to deal with that. Well, there is one type of surgery. It's called the mother of all surgeries. We're going to remove like four organs and then do these horrible things with, with the rest of you. Okay, I'm going to have to deal with that. And the hits kept coming and then 18 months survival. And, and so I've just been a cornered cat for the last four weeks. And remember, this went from five weeks prior. I had no symptoms. I was doing fantastic. I had no idea this was going to happen. So in the flip of a switch, just imagine four weeks from now, literally, that's all taking place. And I was able to get access to this incredible hospital in Texas for my cancer. It's called MD Anderson, it's a great cancer hospital. And, and I was getting some treatment uh, from the Air Force and they were doing a good job, but they didn't really know this cancer and so it was much more appropriate to send me to this place where they'd seen it before and where they could give me better treatment. Well, here's the thing, as I'm driving over to Houston from San Antonio, I have this sense of dread on me and it's just getting worse and worse and worse as we get closer to Houston. I'm with my family and I'm just completely quiet as I get close and I can't figure out why. This should be kind of be a happy moment, right? Because I'm finally getting the treatment that I really need and I'm, I just can't shake this feeling of dread and I've been familiar with some pretty negative thoughts in the past four weeks, but this one was the worst. So we get there, we get to the hospital, my wife drops me off, I start to walk inside and it's this massive building in downtown Houston, I look up at it and it's just window after window going up into infinity in a skyscraper. And I realize why I have this feeling of dread and anxiety. Because I'm about to walk into the building I'm gonna die in. And I'm gonna die there pretty soon. And in that moment, I stopped walking and I closed my eyes and I said, God, this isn't fair. Like five weeks ago, I was doing fantastic picture of good health. Now I've got these horrific things happening to me. I've done everything you asked me to do. I've done everything right. I'm mad. And I said, fix this now. Heal me now. And I had tears streaming down my face, people walking by me. I didn't care who saw me. That's the lowest point in my life. And when I opened up my eyes, I locked eyes with another person. 
There's this little girl being wheeled into the hospital. She had a mask over her face. She had a bald head. And she's looking right at me. And she had beautiful blue eyes. And in her eyes, I can tell that she's afraid. And she's about to go undergo some of the things that I'm dreading. In that second, all of my sense of self-pity was gone. In that moment, everything that had been thinking about the second beforehand about woe is me, my life's terrible, was completely gone. And all I could think was, God, I'm so sorry. I've had the most amazing life. I'm a fighter pilot. I'm doing everything I dreamed of. I'm 33 years old. I've got a beautiful family. Don't help me. Help that little girl. And she was wheeled into the hospital. The doors closed. And I didn't see her again. But it changed my life from that point forward. It taught me that I get to choose my reaction. That if I could have the light switched on the worst moment of my life into that type of recognition in, in a matter of a second, and appreciation for everything I've got and gratitude, then I can choose to do that every single day. And it transformed me. It was exactly what I needed. I asked God to heal me, and he did. He didn't heal me in the way I wanted, make the cancer go away, but he healed me in the way I needed, and that made all the difference. And here's the most powerful thing about doing that. The reason I get excited about telling you this story, even though it's hard for me to do it, I get choked up every time I say it, is because every time I do this, I connect with more and more people, other people who are living a survivor's obligation, other people who are doing amazing things. And I want to finish off this presentation with a video of some of the amazing people that I've gotten to meet through this whole experience and some of the things people are accomplishing despite their adversity and creating something called post-traumatic growth, which is just as real as post-traumatic stress. met a lot of really interesting people. There's one guy, he's in his 30s or 40s, and he was um, an American fighter pilot, but he also had stage four cancer. And I got speaking to him, and he said that, you know, a lot of people that go through such terrible things have something called survivor's remorse. You kind of get guilty that, why did I survive? What's so special about me? But he said he wasn't gonna live his life being guilty. Instead, he was gonna live his life through something called survivor's obligation. He now has an obligation as a survivor to the other people that didn't survive to basically live your life to the fullest and make the most of it. And that really stuck with me. Let's go. You're killing it. Super excited to be here. Very first thing that we did was to go see our friend Jack. And I'm now still fighting. I still have an obligation to myself, to my friends, to my family. The fact that you need to make the most out of your day and just your time on this planet. I'm about to swim the English Channel. Unbelievable swim! Thank you everybody, thank you all so, so much! We did it! Where did that come from? I have to go to the bathroom. Oh, okay. I love the idea of working so hard that you don't think you can you can go another inch, but you push yourself five more inches. You don't think you can go another step, but you push yourself ten more steps. Well, this is him completing a lap around the pool at three years old, only four months after surgery to remove most of his lung. 
I completed an Ironman triathlon on the five-year anniversary of beating cancer without ever having done a marathon, triathlon, or endurance event of any type. Yeah, yeah! On our way to the top of Mount Kilimanjaro. But you are a survivor too. If you're watching this, you've survived. So I told you that story about that little girl that I came in contact that transformed my life. And I said that I never saw her again, which is mostly true. Because I've shared this story now for the past 10 years, I got this message this past summer on LinkedIn of all places. And it's this individual I've never met before. I'm not connected with him. And he said, Joel, I saw that uh, you shared this story about this little girl that uh, was being wheeled into the hospital and she transformed your life. And it's an amazing story. And I'm here to tell you that in March of 2010, I was wheeling my little girl into Ebony Anderson. And she had beautiful blue eyes. And she was bald at the time. And she was very afraid in that moment. He said, but she wasn't afraid four years later when she passed away. And we determined that that was that little girl. You saw her in that video just now. That's been the power of sharing these stories, the human conditioning, conditioning, the suffering that all of us go through, but it's the opportunity to use that suffering to unlock bigger and better things in our lives. And not just do it for ourselves, not do it out of ego, but do it out of sense of we go. Not just out of success and a pursuit for our own identity, but out of a pursuit of significance. Ladies and gentlemen, go out there, build an elite, diverse team, and take them on an amazing adventure. Thanks for having me out here today. I'll stick around afterwards too if anybody wants to ask additional questions. The question is, what kind of cancer do you have? And it was called appendix cancer, which when you hear that, you're like, appendix cancer? Okay, tonsil cancer, pinky cancer, who cares, take it. But uh, it's, it's super dangerous. So Stuart Scott, you guys remember the ESPN commentator, Stuart Scott? He had that awesome ESPY award speech a couple of years ago uh, that I, I watch all the time still. So he had appendix cancer, and he got it about a year after I did, and he's already passed away. So uh, it's, the, they give you the mother of all surgeries is the only way to treat it, and it's pretty horrific. What other questions you guys have? What was yep. the diagnosis? You said you felt good. Did you just go to the doctor for a random? Or yeah, random? And, and that's a great question because I always scare people when I say that. That you know, they're, they're, It's not that there was no symptoms, so don't, you know, don't, uh, don't feel like you, this diagnosis is waiting around the corner for you too. Here's what I felt. I had a sense of discomfort in this area where your appendix is. On a scale of one to 10, I call it like a two. But I had it for about a year. And every time I'd fly, if you guys know flying in a fighter plane, you wear a G suit, so I have a G suit on. It inflates against me when I pull Gs, so I push the blood into my head. Well, it creates pressure in all the places where it inflates. And so when it would do that, I would feel pressure right here, just kind of discomfort. I could never shift around and get, it, get rid of it. And so I kept telling my flight docs about it. And they would say, ah, oh, you're working out too hard. Ah, oh, you've got an infection, it'll go away, whatever. And we, we all, including me, kept saying, I'm, I'm in too good a health right now. I'm sure it's nothing. And, but I did have definite signs leading up to it. And if I was paying attention really close, I would see that I was getting sick a little more often and just a couple of other things that were taking place that, uh, that could have been some canaries in the coal mine. What are the questions you guys have? How's my family? Phenomenal. So if you caught it in the video, my son actually had a tumor at the exact same time. Unbelievably. I don't even talk about it because it's, it's like another hour worth of, of presentation. So I'm on one side of the hospital. My son's on the other. He had most of his left lung removed. I had my stuff going on literally at the same time. Within f uh, two weeks of each other, we're having surgery. Within four weeks of each other, we had the diagnoses at the same time. So just living everybody's worst nightmare. 
And my wife, my saint of a wife who went through this and, and usually in the past had been the type of person to get upset when her purse spilled over, is now like taking charge like nobody's business and running things with this incredible perseverance and endurance that none of us believed that she, she was even capable of. And I was so impressed by it. It's transformed our family, shown us what we can accomplish, shown us what we can do, kept us as a, a really solid unit. You know, I don't wish the, these trials on anybody. Uh, and I always say I would, I would never go through cancer again, of course, for, you know, a million dollars. I wouldn't go through it for a million dollars. I wouldn't give up the lessons I learned from cancer for a hundred million dollars. I really wouldn't. It was that transformative in my life. What are there questions you guys have? Sir, if you could go back to your time at the Air Force Academy, what's one thing you would change or do differently? Yep, so I was a pretty bitter cadet. The question is, what would you do differently? I was bitter because I felt like I didn't deserve this and my friends were all having fun at their keg parties and doing all these cool things and I don't understand why people are being mean to me. And I don't necessarily agree with every single thing that takes place in, 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 at the academy in terms of what they do, but I have to say, looking back, it was the foundation for every success I've been afforded. And I wish when I was sitting in your chairs that I didn't spend each day being angry or frustrated or thinking about how I was going to skirt the system and you know I wasn't going to sell out and be a part of uh, this, this institution and in, in, in other ways. Uh, I, I wish I would have taken it more seriously because one, it's an enormous opportunity. You guys are never going to be surrounded by another group of people that's this committed to learning together, to developing their character together, to going through this transformation uh, probably for the rest of your lives. I've come close in like flight school, came close in MBA, but this was, this was really the laboratory that I should have been paying the most attention to. What else? What's next? Good question. So the chapter in my life right now, uh, Afterburner's an, an incredible chapter, CEO of that team and, and loving it. I've only been CEO for the last six months. I've been with them for seven years. And uh, in, in terms of next, I want to just keep inspiring people and help them to take it to the next level. We're looking at uh, rolling this out as a methodology that transforms people and lives at a greater scale because once again, I'm not about success. I'm not about my bank account. I'm about significance. And so that's what I'm pursuing at the end of the day. Yep. Great, great, great question. What would you say to somebody who's trying to find their obligation? Well, I would say to you, figure out what makes you excited in life. What, what makes you tick? If you're not engaged in something, find something that, that stirs your passions. And it's probably this. It's probably the thing you're afraid of. There's a great quote from the book, Who Moved Your Cheese? That I think about all the time. It's a dumb title of a book, incredible quote. Read it, it's like 50 pages, so it's a quick read. The quote is this, what would you do if you weren't afraid? I think everybody should ask themselves that question because on the other side of fear are the things that are most transformative in our lives and the other side of our discomfort are the things that we need to be doing but we don't. I got really comfortable with living a cozy, coasting life. I can tell you exactly what happened to Jack Bauer in all seven seasons of 24, which by the way is 24 hours of your life every time you watch a season. So I've done that for a week of my life and then realized that was a week I would never get back when I was at the end of my life. I had to transition into figuring out what I was afraid of and I was stiff arming the entire time. What else? Last question, please. Pardon me? It's how do you say thank you? So get the book, Survivor's Obligation, all my profits go to charity. So that same charity that we, I talked about earlier at Kilimanjaro, we're helping to build girls' schools in Africa. We're still doing that. We've helped out 15,000 girls in Africa at this point. We're, we're, our goal is to get to 80,000 young women. They've got amazing stories of now coming back to uh, this part of Africa as they're, as they're getting older and coming back as professionals and adding back into uh, in the environment. It's just such a cool, such a cool story of, of these, these young women who didn't have any chances, and I don't know if you know the history of this part of the world, but they're, they're effectively married off as quickly as they can be at a very young age, really tragic and unrealized potential, and now we're sheltering them from that and giving them an opportunity to, uh, to go through these schools instead. Um, I, I didn't start this one. I'm just honored to be a part of it, and we've helped to throw a lot of money that way. All my book proceeds go there as well. Thank you again so much, too.